This is Paul Burnett interviewing Dick Teets for the mining project. And this is October 12th, 2014, the Marriott City Center, Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were talking about the early days at Nucor. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what was innovative about Nucor? It, Nucor was innovative before you got there. Uh, what's, their, what's their claim to fame? Uh, well, Nucor uh, was experimenting with um, thin slab casting uh, for many years uh, before uh, we, the attempt to commercialize it. And so uh, they were on the cutting edge uh, on a number of items. And as I said earlier, they were also the first to really commercialize big beams when Nucor and, uh, and Yamato Kojo teamed up to make... Uh, a new core Yamato, which is down in Blytheville, Arkansas, and that has become a, you know, basically a three million ton a year facility, making up to I think forty four inch jumbo beams. I mean, some of the biggest in the world, out of near net cast uh, shapes, and so very highly efficient and uh, the full range of. Uh, I think there they go all the way down to about fourteen inch beams. Uh, they don't make the small ones there, but tremendously efficient, and that was just mind-boggling to the integrated beam producers. And, uh, and that was starting up just about the time I joined Nucor. Um, I got recruited to be the engineering manager at, uh, at Nucor Crawfordsville. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it, it was a, that was just, a, just an interesting opportunity for me. Again, I tried to be uh, involved with technology at LTV uh, and then I, that's why I joined Nucor because it was the first in the world thin slab. Now they were trying to pioneer on their own mm -hmm. um, different technologies, and they had then decided to to work with SMS out of Germany, uh, Schlom and Cmag, um, on their technology and to uh, commercialize it. And they chose a site in uh, Crawfordsville, Indiana, to uh, build this facility. As I said, I was the engineering manager. And with Nucor, everything done with, was done with speed. And I'll give you just a real quick little example of that. You know, I, on my second day on the job, I, I uh, now I left LTV. They were in bankruptcy for the second time. And, uh, and for us to do a project, I, I, I said to you earlier one time that, that sometimes we would just go so slow, we missed the markets. And we could build a, a, a book this big on, on uh, pr project spec and market studies and technology and, and then quotes and, and take two years to do a project, three years, whatever. And so here we are with Nucor. And I, so I said on my first night in town to uh, my new boss, Keith Bussey, I said, hey, uh, can you show me the, uh, the market study so I know why we're building this steel mill? Here and he says, "Well, we didn't do one. Nucor didn't do one." I said, "What do you mean you didn't do one?" He says, "Ah, you know, but just building this thing and two hundred and you know million dollars, and we're gonna sell, we'll sell it." I was shocked, you know. I said, oh God, this is uh, why did I why did I come with you guys? This is kind of too wild and crazy for me because I'm an engineer. I'm I'm a little more organized than this. I said, "Okay." Then they say, hey, you better get out there early in the morning because uh, there's going to be picketers out there that the uh, operating engineers are going to pick at the job site. So he says, you get out there, Dick, early about uh, 4 a.m. and get a camera, a movie camera out of the drawer. and you, you get up close to the fence and videotape everyone so in case there's any violence, you know, that we can get an injunction against these guys. I'm thinking, oh, God, you know, why did I leave my job? You know, in Cleveland, I was real calm and, you know, I... I I didn't really mind it that bad, but uh, so uh, that's, that's on the first day of the job. Then the second day of the job, I go into the construction trailer and I said to the construction manager, I said, uh, "Hey, I got to ask you, what gives you the right to build a steel mill? You know, like how do you get that permission?" And he says, "See that placard in the window there? That's what gives you the right." So I look at the placard and it says, "By the order of the, the fire marshal of Montgomery County, Indiana, you know, Nucor Steel is allowed to build a." steel mill at the intersection of 400 east and 400 south. I said, you're telling me that the fire marshal of Montgomery County can give you the permission to build a steel mill? He says, yep. I said, okay, 
well, it just just that didn't make sense to me. So I go back to my trailer, construction trailer, and I make a few phone calls and, and I look it up and I you know I go to I call IDEM, Indian Department of Environmental Management. And I said, hey, yeah, I'm with this company called Nucor. I'm the engineering manager. We're going to build a steel mill. We're building a steel mill out here in Crawfordsville. And they said, yeah, yeah, you want to build a steel mill? Yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. And they said, yeah, you better come down and meet us. I said, okay, when? They said, how about Thursday morning? So I was two more days. I said, okay, I'll be there. What time? Ten o'clock. Okay. So I go down there. They got a meeting room, huge meeting room. Everybody from environmental quality of you know whether it be solid waste or you know hazardous waste, uh, you know water quality, air quality, you name them. There must have been twenty people, twenty five people in there. So I walk in and I said, hey, uh, you know, nice to meet you. I got my business cards temporary. I just got them that day, you know, a couple of days earlier. I said, hey, well, we're building a steel mill. They said, no, you want to build a steel mill. I said, no, we're building a steel mill. They said, no, you want to build a steel mill. I said, oh, I was pretty sure we're building a steel mill this morning. We're putting steel up. No, you can't. Oh, yeah, well, we are. He said, well, you can't. You haven't even done a year's worth of pre-construction monitoring. I said, well, well, I'm just telling you we're building a steel mill. So they said, oh, that's bad. I said, how bad? They said, oh, real bad. you got to go see the EPA up in Chicago. I said, do I need an attorney? Oh, yeah, they're all attorneys up there. I said, who should I hire as an attorney? They said, we can't tell you that. I said, well, okay, well, then tell me. When you walk into the court, who don't you want to see at the other end, at the other table? So they told me this guy's name. I said, well, who does he work for? Well, uh, this other co this company. And they said, I said, where, where can I find him? Well, he's up the street, you know, up by the monument. I said, okay, thanks. So I left. I walked up the street. I walked in. And I said, hey, I need to talk to this guy. We have an appointment. Nope. I said, well, I'll just wait until he, you know, he's here today. Yeah, I'll just wait until it takes. So he said, I meet him finally after about three hours of waiting. And they, he says, yeah, yeah, you need me, you know. So I see. He says, I'll call the EPA. We had to go up to the EPA. They said, oh, you're in big trouble. I said, well. So we call home. I call. We I tell the boss. We call the CEO of Nucor. I said, "Hey, we're in trouble here, you know." And he said, uh, "We're building a steel mill. We don't have any 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 permits. None of the permits." And then he says, "Well, you have a, you have you have some work cut out for you." I said, "Yeah, I guess we do." He says, "Well, all I'm going to do is tell you this: Do not stop constructing, no matter what." He said, I said, "Oh, they said this millions and millions of dollars fine." He says, "I don't care. You just don't you know you just don't make, lose one day of construction. You pay whatever you have to pay because I'm telling you, there's so much money to be made in this in this in this industry with this technology. You just keep building. You do whatever you have to." This was you know, and I this is like. My second week in the job, and it's like know? the Wild West. It was, and it was, and so we we negotiated it, and I and I negotiated uh, to like two million dollar fine. I paid you know whatever two thousand dollars a day fine for months as we, we did all the permitting and got everything. We did it all legally then, but it was not the way it was ever done. You know, it was mind boggling, but we got it done. And so, uh, but he just said, "I'm telling you, you just take care of business and uh, make it right." But just do not stop. This is this is put this technology to work, man. This is this is going to be amazing. And so we built that steel mill with uh, under all kinds of pressure and uh, you know. But it was go go go. So it's it's not as if they were unaware of the EPA, which had been established almost two decades previously. It's that they well, it didn't matter. No, no, it, it wasn't that they were callous. It was because every mini mill that was built prior to this was so small it fell under the guidelines. Okay. So in their mind, this was another one, but they they didn't realize. No, this was this is a mini mill, mini mill in in equipment, mini mill in management philosophy, mini mill in every sense of the word, except it was big. Output. Wow. Yeah, output. And therefore, multiply the output times the emissions per ton, and it's big enough to fall above all the thresholds of requiring permits. It, it, that didn't register on anybody, you know? And so it was like, you're in a new world, people. Yeah. There, this whole thing is new. Yeah. So that, it was the first big mini mill right. to be built. Right. So it was like, welcome to the new world. Yeah. Now you're in the big leagues, right? And so I was. I, so I'm. I'm the engineering manager, and I'm the face of all this in front of all these admit all these administrators and so forth. I said, "Oh, okay." So I said, "I can't believe I'm here." I, uh, I was engaged at the time. I said to my girlfriend, "I said, oh, oh boy, I, I think I, I'm going to quit and go back to LTV." And she said, "Give me the best advice in the world." She says. You're going to go back to a company that's in bankruptcy for the second time when all you did was talk about going to this company that's on the cutting edge of technology. They do, they're, they're so good to their employees and every, they're, I mean, everything's so right. And you're going to leave? She said, give it one more week. And I gave it one more week and now I'm, I was there for, you know, 
the rest of my career is in mini mill and so forth. But uh, what what a time! So we built, we went like gangbusters. You know, we uh, we got it built in, I don't know, mm, less than two years, eighteen months or so, mm -hmm. and uh, and and we. Ultimately, built other equipment there, galvanizing lines and so forth, and did extremely well. And uh, and we were the f and and most people said to us, and we were getting literature from other integrated companies that kept s saying they'll never work. And and for a while we didn't and and we could not get it started. We truly could not get it running. And we were working on a plan B about tearing the equipment out. We really did get to that point of frustration of worry that this was a grand mistake. Mm -hmm. And so I was working as the engineering manager on what do I do when, when we have to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. But after about, I don't know, six or seven months of just failure, everyday failures, and that really works on you, and you got all these employees and their families all counting on you, and you're trying to give them pump up, you know, you know hang in there, right. we're making progress, and, and, and progress may have been so small that's you know management 101 of how do you keep morale up and you don't have people quitting and going back to farming or going back to the shoe store or right. or whatever. Right. Oh boy, that was a tough one, but yeah. uh, but uh, ultimately we prevailed <laughs> and had some breakthroughs and we had a and we had to look at things totally differently and because it was you had no one else to call. Right. It was the first in the world right. and so there it was just. Uh, it, it, I mean, I could tell you what we did, but it wouldn't make it wouldn't technically it would technically wouldn't you know, yeah. it that wouldn't help you. But but it was amazing that uh, it was like oh, and then after where you say ah mm -hmm. should have thought of that. Why didn't anyone? Why didn't all the consultants we talked to? Why didn't all the operators we talked to? Why wouldn't anyone think of that? Mm -hmm. And yet it was just through trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, mm -hmm. and finally stumbled upon it and. I mean, with good thought, right? Tried it and said, "Hey, it works." Right? Hey, it worked. Wow, it worked. Right? And then all of a sudden, it was like, "Get out of the way!" Everyone, these guys work so darn hard, and uh, things started coming together, and we really made a ton of progress, and we kept expanding the place, and and it was great. So um, I know you don't. It it might be difficult to talk about the tech technical aspects of it, but. Um, these were incremental technical changes in the way that you would do something, a procedure? Well, this was, a, this, again, this was thin slab casting, which was the first in the world, and it had only been done in a large scale laboratory. Mm -hmm. And so to cast this molten metal, solidify it, and then have it, and in a laboratory, it would run out, let's say, 90 feet. Mm -hmm. And that was all they had space for. Right. The lab was only that big, and then they ran into a highway, let's right. say. Right. And so now we were trying to make it cast continuously right. uh, all the way into a rolling mill that was uh, hundreds of feet away mm -hmm. and to make production. Um, and, and you had to then cast at a higher speed to get surface quality that was sellable. Mm -hmm. And we were we, a slab, it's called a thin slab. So there's a lubricant. There's these the the casting molds are copper, mm -hmm. basically copper, and they're water cooled mm -hmm. from the outside. They're I mean inside the molds, but but they're copper faced, and you're pouring liquid steel into these copper jacketed molds, mm -hmm. and it, and it's solidifying as it goes through. So as mm -hmm. it comes out the bottom, it's solid, a skin of solid steel but still liquid in the center and then as it goes down through these containment rolls it solidifies from the outside in mm -hmm. so that by the time it bends at the very bottom it's a solid slab of steel now in big steel they do from 8 inches to 14 inches thick mm -hmm. by yay wide right and so they have that technology and they're casting maybe i don't know say 40 inches a minute Mm -hmm. 30 inches a minute, very mm -hmm. slow, very right. slow. And these are almost like ingots. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Big, you know, not ingots, but like but, them. But yeah. for a layman, that's okay right. term. Okay. You know, but for us, we're only casting two inches thick uh, by the same width almost. And so we have to cast a lot faster to get some volume through there. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't get stuck in there. Mm -hmm. And what, you, what everyone uses, big steel and everyone, they, they use a, a, a glass powder that you put in. It's called mold powder. Mm -hmm. And you put it in on top, and it melts on top of this liquid metal. 
and then it, it and, and as it goes down through, I'm not going to go through all the mechanics, but it, it's drawn down between the copper and the steel to keep it from sticking together. It lubricates it yeah. and is drawn down. And by the time it comes out the bottom, it has turned into a powder and basically flicks, flicks away right. uh, and it goes out, but it lubricates it. Now, it's a, it, it basically has a shape and you, it might be a ball, might be a little like a little tiny head of a pin mm -hmm. uh, ball, but some it can also be like a star flake or like a, a snowflake or or all kinds. It has a shape. You make them that way. It's it's man made, and um, and so we were using the integrated steels slab mold powders mm -hmm. and trying all kinds of them for different different Results. chemistries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Turns out we needed to use a billet caster. A billet is a, a, usually a square or a rectangle. Let's say a, a four by four, a five by five, a four by six for making small bars mm -hmm. because a billet casts much faster. Mm -hmm. Well, huh, it's the speed of the steel is what we had a, we failed to recognize, not the geometry of the big wide slab. We were using a slab mold powder. We needed to use a billet type mold powder configuration mm. chemistry mixture in the mold to because of the speed of the cast, not necessarily the geometry of the cast. Right. And it took us a couple months to, to for our guys, my partner Mark Millet and one of his metallurgists to come up with that idea mm. just as a, as a out of, I'll say out of frustration of what else can we try? Right. Well, well why don't we try this? Huh. It worked. And you're saying, so this was initially um, produced in laboratory and so there was experimental research that this draws from. This was done at a university or an at, at, lab. A, at a company's at a laboratory company's lab. in Germany. Okay. But it, but again, because it was so short, they could never get up to a speed. So they never they they used a slab caster mold powder because right. it was done in slow motion. Right. And therefore, there was never any thought about what else could be done. So this is the innovation in scaling up. Yes. And, and getting the throughput. Yeah, needing to commercialize it. Right. 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 So that was uh, the first first commercial success. And again, everyone in the integrated world saying this will never work. These guys, we were all young. We were all 33, 30 years old, 29 years old. And they said, ah, these guys are too young. They don't, they, they don't even, they aren't even old enough to know why it won't work, you know? And so we were just young, you know, cowboys out there in the country, mm -hmm. you know, working uh, seven days a week for, you know, year, two years, just putting our efforts at trying to build this steel mill around this technology and and it worked it worked <laughs> it went, yeah it worked and everyone says it won't work it won't work these guys just aren't smart enough to know why it won't work mm -hmm. and then ultimately it worked it's almost like the the narrative of the startups in silicon valley you know taking a, a new direction and and the sort of older eastern uh, companies that that you know Bell Labs and those mm -hmm. that, that, that they were kind of mired in the past or something, mm -hmm. and this was a new way of 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 approaching things and thinking creatively about about how to how to create something com more or less completely new. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but and the the story is basically getting this tremendous throughput, right? That's what thin clap thin slab casting does. In comparison to the older ways of well, it's not the throughput; it's the low cost. Again, it goes back just like to the beam guys. Right. You're you're casting, and you were doing it with 500 employees and putting out. You know, here we are, like at our plant in Butler, we put out three over three million tons a year with 600 employees, mm -hmm. and we have there's integrated plants out there that put out two million or 1.8 million tons and have 6,000 or 5,000 employees plus all those other ancillary upstream you know, facilities in the coal mines and so forth that you, and you say, how can they even, how, you know, <laughs> stay in business, right. you know? Now, again, we don't make every product. Mini mills still don't make exposed automotives, mm -hmm. you know, uh, skin uh, steels, and there's some products that we don't make, but they, they said we'd never make a flat rolled product either. Mm -hmm. So th the war's not over. Right. You know, right. It's, it's still young. Right. You know, the steel industry has been around for 100, 250 years, and right. we've only been around for 20. Right. 
And, uh, and so this is a great success once it's, once it's done. And this is roughly 1987 to 1990. Yep, to 90, 90. Yep, it took us until 90. Mm -hmm. to, again, we had a cold mill we put in, and, and we were actually buying hot bands from our big steel competitors mm -hmm. and then processing them while we were trying to get the, our hot side up and running and get the quality up to being able to make something out of it and mm -hmm. so forth, yeah. So can you talk then about the genesis? You've had this tremendous success. What leads you and your, your colleagues to to start something new? Can you talk about the genesis of, of Steel Dynamics? Yeah, it... Um, yeah, then, uh, well, Nucor was going through a transformation. Um, um, it was in a, in a growth mode, mm -hmm. and, um, and um, Keith Bussey uh, was the, plant, was the uh, vice president general manager of Crawfordsville. He hired, hired me from away from LTV, and, and Mark Millett was the uh, melt shop uh, manager at, at Nucor Crawfordsville. He was a metallurgist, a young guy. He, uh, I mean, when he came to Crawfordsville, um, he was probably in his late 20s, and I was in my early 30s. And so, uh, again, that's why they said, we, and the other guys were about the same age. We, why we, they said we weren't old enough to know anything. But, uh, but Keith, uh, Keith was in competition uh, to become president of Nucor, and and uh, and. Um, Myself and Mark were in competition for other plants mm -hmm. as they were growing, and and um, Keith didn't uh, did not become president. He was like runner up, mm -hmm. and um, and I was runner up for the biggest project in Nucor, and and that was okay because my wife did not want to go where the plant was, and so she was happy, and I was happy with that. But I thought, hey, this is fine because now I was the bridesmaid, so therefore. Hey, uh, I should be in pretty good stead with what's coming next, mm -hmm. and um, and then in, uh, the plant where Mark uh, had done his experimentation with thin slab casting in Darlington, uh, South Carolina, where which he really liked that part of the country, uh, that plant managership came available, and he was he thought for sure that he would have a good chance to go back there. Well, you know, all of us, uh, I with myself. Six plants came and six plants went and and I didn't get the call and and so forth and and it was all sort of because of the competition between Keith and the guy who did become the president and and again I'm not saying uh, that that I deserved any of them more than the guys who got them um, but I but the, it went from being a very transparent company when I when I knew I was runner up for the biggest project. I knew how the vote went. I knew who voted for. They told us who voted for you mm -hmm. and who didn't vote for you. It was that transparent, right? You know. And so uh, they said, "Hey, this is how many voted for each of you." And Dick, this is who voted for you, but you lost. Mm -hmm. hmm. Then after that, we never heard it. All you heard was who the winner was. Yeah. You know. And so I said, "Hey, this, things have changed so much under the new president mm -hmm. that uh, I said, Keith." Uh, I, hey, I love you dearly, but I'm not going to retire here in Crawfordsville. I got uh, my wife doesn't uh, isn't really happy in Indiana. She'd like to go back to Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. so forth. And so I'm going to give you you know six months notice. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to stick around and get my profit sharing. Mm -hmm. But if you're upset, I don't mind you if you want to whack me. Go ahead. But uh, but I'm giving you full you know a lot of a lot of a notice because. So you have time to decide who you take my job. Then he says, "Hey, I, I'm not happy either. I'm I'm looking around too, but don't say so. Don't say anything, anyone." <laughs> I said, "Okay, hey, that's our secret." And like a month and a half or two months later, he says, "Hey, you wouldn't guess, but you know, Millet's uh, he's upset because he didn't uh, get the Darlington job." And I said, uh, "Well, neither did I. That was another one. I mean, that was just one more that I didn't get, and uh, and uh, nor did he." And so now you got three of us that were disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark and I for not getting promoted. Keith for just for ongoing reasons. Mm -hmm. So, so we just started. Then uh, we interviewed with one or two companies as a team. Mm -hmm. And even though we got offered jobs, we said, "Well, those companies aren't as good as Nucor. Mm -hmm. Why would we leave a better company to go uh, to a company that, even if we wanted to improve it, wouldn't make it 
probably wouldn't be as good as Nucor. Right. So we're not that upset with you know that we can do that. You know? And so we were just sitting around one night uh, having beers at a local restaurant in Indianapolis and just said, you know, we got to just damn well do this for ourselves because we know what we're doing. And it was like, yeah, right. No, yeah, we got to just think about this. And so we did, and we put together a business plan and went out and got uh, two individuals who had, in passing, maybe in jest, but, but had the financial capabilities of coming up with, let's say, uh, 10 or $15 million. You know, they said, if you really want to own your own steel company, we could be the guys who could maybe do it with you. Hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and then we said, well, that's not enough money, but let's keep talking. And then uh, once they so showed real seriousness, you know, then we decided we couldn't uh, stay as employees. It was wouldn't be fair to Nucor mm -hmm. for us to be working uh, for our, something else and still stay at Nucor. Mm -hmm. So then we had decided to part ways. Mm -hmm. And we still didn't have a company. We still didn't have financing. We had two guys who each gave us a, a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and we put one million down on equipment that we already knew what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were that confident. Right. We had nothing else, but we took one million and we put it in the bank to start paying uh, a temporary office and pay ourselves and, uh, and our clerk. We hired a clerk, an accountant, and so forth. And then we took the other million and put it on some long lead time equipment for a rolling mill. Mm -hmm. And because um, I already knew what a, what kind of rolling mill I wanted to buy to make better 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 a product than what Nucor was making at either of the two rolling mills that they, they one at Crawfordsville and one at Hickman. Mm -hmm. And so when I say better, lighter, thinner, higher strength, a different product niche mm -hmm. that we wanted to go after. What would these products be used for that they couldn't use them for Nucor? Um, well, they just couldn't, they could they, they they couldn't make it, mm -hmm. you know, because of the design. They couldn't. Uh, I wanted. I wanted uh, rolling mills that could get that could develop higher torque and and so forth. And customers were asking, f asking for the opportunity because I wanted to substitute uh, light gauge hot band for coal rolled and save the customer, let's say thirty five to forty dollars a ton. And if I could do that, uh, I thought we'd get rewarded with with orders mm -hmm. and uh, and nobody meaning even the integrated guys couldn't couldn't provide that product mm -hmm. and so that's why we decided to use that as a basis in our in our uh, business plan mm -hmm. and uh, and these were did you have initial customers in mind were they local or were they no, no no just based on what we knew about the customers we were dealing with it at, at, and ones that we couldn't deal with. Right. You know, so sometimes you learn more from the guys who won't do business with you right. than the ones that you do do business with. Right. They'd say, well, this would be great if it were if, cheaper. If, yeah, exactly. If it was cheaper or yeah. flatter or, or higher quality or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then that's what we designed our business plan around. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then we went out and, and then ultimately uh, raised uh, $83 million of equity. Uh, mm -hmm. between uh, those two original business partners, mm -hmm. one being a scrap supplier, which was our raw materials, mm -hmm. one being uh, our largest customer and still our largest customer, and then the two others were Bain Capital and GE Capital, Bain being where Mitt Romney right. was a partner, managing, and uh, the GE Capital, of course, right. was at the time was uh, Jack Welsh, mm -hmm. you know, was uh, running GE. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, but we, oh, we had so many people turn us down Mm -hmm. I mean, it was disheartening. There were days we just shook our heads and said, "Why did we ever leave Nucor?" I mean, mm -hmm. you know. And again, it took us ninety days. No, it took us it it took us till June, a lot more than ninety days, because we left in September, mm -hmm. and it took us to the end of the year really to get our act together and get out in a road show and so forth. But then it took us till June thirtieth to get all the paperwork, everything signed, and we it it took us uh, about. I think we raised ninety eight eighty three million dollars of equity, about um, fifty some million dollars worth of uh, subordinated debt, and then whatever three hundred million dollars of senior debt, different tranches and so forth. And everyone in the financial community said this is was an amazingly fast deal because he, three guys with with nothing else except a story. To raise this kind of money mm -hmm. that fast, 
And yet, here, to the three guys, it was excruciatingly slow. Because right. we had never experienced anything like it, but every day was painful because mm -hmm. we didn't know if it was ever going to happen. Right. So, I mean, what's extraordinary about it, it, it sounds like a story of, again, venture capital in the high technology industry. But it's in the steel industry, which you associate with slow and stayed. But that was kind of your innovation in your brand was to take the very latest and the very best and start small and think of a particular niche that and 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 fight on the margin and 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 work with thirty five forty dollars a ton off yeah. off the going price and uh and that's an extraordinary uh story so this is june of this june was 90, of 94. Uh, uh, 94 now 94 june okay. of 94 so because everyone was saying oh we have too much steel in our portfolio great story i mean everyone had the same oh nice guys good story love to have you in our portfolio but no you know, but no, but no, everyone, oh, it was tragic. Did you ever get any word through any kind of grapevine about, because that's what the problem is, wait, why does someone say no? You almost never find out. Yeah, did no. You, did you get a sense of, was it too new? Was it too strange? I uh, can't tell you. <laughs> no, because we went around the world. We went everywhere. I mean, we, we it was the road show, I mean, uh, to everywhere. I mean, but then in the end, like all of our sub senior debt, we had banks from Japan and from France and from Germany and the United States. I mean, we had we had tremendous support in the equity because, again, that's much safer. Right. Or, or not equity. I'm sorry, the senior debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, subordinated debt, uh, even we had some Japanese banks and... and uh, and and uh, Austrian, uh, as well as U.S. and and some some uh, financial houses. Mm -hmm. and but what's the difference between senior and subordinated debt? Uh, they have like a uh, they they have a higher interest rate, mm -hmm. and actually uh, then have stock. Um, whenever you make the payment, you finally pay them off. They end up getting some stock. Mm -hmm. You know. So they have a they they have a position. It's it's the loan shark side of the yeah exactly. <laughs> but they but they but they but they aren't they're after the senior debt gets paid off first. If there's a bankruptcy, they're they're uh, in a privileged they're, position. Yeah, yeah. but but uh, equities last, but mm -hmm. subordinated is next to last. Mm -hmm. Let's say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so it was interesting. And you're not, although you're an expert in in um, operations, um, and you have to know a lot about money to do that. Um, you were not necessarily an expert in finance. Did you get some outside consulting about whom to approach for this project? Like, how did you know to approach X Bank or, or Bain, or how did you know? Well, we hired an investment banker to uh, to help us uh, with our roadshow and so <laughs> forth. But, uh, you know, just like uh, many mills, we hired the, I want maybe the lowest cost guy and also the one that would take the money at the end. Right. You know, that take would only take on expenses right. up front. And then uh, would that would take uh, take it upon completion and success because mm -hmm. everyone else wanted to be paid up front or a lot of it up front, and we said we don't have any money. Right. You know, no one's going to give us money up front. We don't have the money. You know, and so we had a we had a wheel and deal a little bit, but that's just when you're working on a shoestring, you know, budget. Mm -hmm. That was us, and we had to say, well, okay, well, let's maybe we don't pay ourselves as much because we weren't making money. I mean, we weren't. Again, we weren't in it to. We we didn't do it to make money and make right. you know we were just doing it to build a steel mill right you know <laughs> sounds kind of silly but that's what it was right right you know we were just in it to... well when you see that um, I mean all of you experience this blockage right you were in line because you don't necessarily want to be on the top because you want to be on the you know it, it, you wanted to do stuff right yeah and once you were blocked from the top position you said I can't grow here I can't do anything Right. And so you, you saw going out on your own is finally your way to say, this is how I'm going to define what I do. Right. Oh, exactly right. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, again, I went to Duquesne here in Pittsburgh to, for my MBA, and I was going, it was a joint law degree because at one time I wanted to be a, a patent lawyer. Mm -hmm. I, I really didn't, even though I was working shifts, you know, uh, you know here in the steel mills, I said, well, I'm going to do this until I get that, right. and then I'm going to find another route. 
but then I got transferred to Cleveland and I had to make a choice and say, well, I can't, uh, I'm not going to get my law degree, at least not here. And so therefore, uh, what am I going to do? And so I had to just finish up one. And the MBA was the, the closest thing I, or the degree that I was closest to finishing. Mm-hmm. So I had to say, well, okay, well, I got to be able to commute back just for a little while until I can finish that. So there was different routes, you know. And so whenever anyone says, did you ever plan your career? Mm-hmm. Did you ever have this path? I, I, when people say, well, you know, tell me where you want to be in five years. I say, don't waste your time. You never know where you're going to be. You know, when you're working underground in a coal mine and a piece of slate falls out of the sky, you know, out of the roof, and you say, whoa, wow, you know, you jump to the side. You don't know. You don't know where you're going to Who knows where you're going to be and right. what, what, what those little things are that, heck, I could have been a patent lawyer and having fun doing it, but, or I could be an unemployed coal miner. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know. Right. So just because if, if I would have gotten a promotion, you know, a new core, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't, I, you know, you'd be interviewing somebody else. Right. And, but you never know what the, what's going to happen. Well, there seem to be two principles that work. I, if I'm, I can be so bold as to, you know, integrate your f- approach to life to how you run companies and do your work. On the one hand, you're, uh, you're an, a mechanical engineer and an operations manager. So you, you have to deal with incredible pressures to manage all these different variables. So it's, it's the ultimate in planning, right? And, and, and making the unpredictable predictable, I imagine. Um, and on the other hand, uh, just tremendous flexibility. You have to be a- adaptable to what comes, because there is this uncertainty, and you have to kind of be able to roll with it. Was there a, a conscious decision about structuring agility into the company? Or is it just the oh, fact that it was oh. small, that, that, that you started with the, having to balance different things? Uh, in, in you mean with SDI? Yeah. Well, yeah, we start, well, we started real small as the hot band only. Mm-hmm. And then, but, but before we even, but while we were under construction, then, uh, then we had a German company come to us and say, hey, they, they thought uh, with the fall of the Iron Curtain that they were going to try to capitalize on some technology and maybe get to build mini mills in the Eastern Bloc. Mm-hmm. And they said, hey, we'd like to learn from you. And what can we learn? Can we invest in you and learn all we can? And if we could give you, uh, pick a number. And we said, well, how about $50 million, let's say. Um, can we learn from you? And we said, okay, yeah, give us $50 million. Well, we took that 50 and then went out and borrowed another $150 million. And we built a whole coal mill complex. And everyone says, you can't build a coal mill complex for fifty million for our $200 million. I said, yeah, we can. We'll do it for 175 is my budget. And they said, well, you can't do that. Watch me. So we did. <laughs> Okay, and and, and I, I got to real quickly revert back. I, I get the reputation uh, in, in within our company and, and and outside of our company that as the builder of the mills. I mean that's why I went along with this because I like building mills, I like building stuff, but I build it into a budget, uh, and and a lot of people just, you know snicker that because I'm. Uh, Tight with the, the money. I mean, I when I I like I built steel mills for less than uh, anybody, and I can say that with a lot of pride. I mean, my parents came out of the depression. I, they were older when I was born. Mm-hmm. I mean, they went. Uh, my dad went to college. My mother didn't. But uh, then after college, my dad went in the. It was World War II, and he went into the Navy and came back, came out afterwards, and then they, uh, you know, ended up working for a while and having kids, but but didn't have much. You know, so if you don't have it, you don't you don't miss it. Right. You know, you don't know you what you don't have. Right. But uh, we never worried about it, and so you know, uh, I always kid everyone. I say, they say, they say what do you do for vacation? I say, well, heck, we went to the uh, the Montreal Expo. Mm-hmm. You know, but we went six years after it was closed, so we got a bargain. You know, but we didn't know it was closed, so you, yeah, hey, this is kind of pretty neat. You know, but I was taught the value of a dime. You know, or a penny. I'm not afraid to pick up a penny. You know, hell, it might be the penny that gets me what I need someday. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so even in building a mill, you say, hey, I'm going to do it for this amount of money. And so when you say you're going to do it, you damn well better do it. And so when we said to our investors, hey, we're going we're to spend, you know, $325 million, 
the investors didn't believe us, so they made us hire an engineering company to watch us. And then they didn't they didn't trust us because we hired them. Then they wanted to hire they hired another engineering company to watch the engineering company that hired us. And you know what? We came in on a budget, and they were shocked. And there's other people who build steel mills that come in 400 million over their budgets, and uh, then they lose those they they lose their ownership, you know, and uh, they're sh everyone's shocked. But those stories are the ones you hear about. Ours, I'm very proud of. And so when we built our mill. Then you have these other people come along and they give you money and they say, hey, here. And then we had uh, a Japanese steel company come along and say, hey, we'd like to give you some money. So we said, well, okay, well, you can give us $40 million. So then we built our iron dynamics project. And, uh, and this is before we even started up. And then we had our partner who uh, on the hot side, who our biggest customer yet, and he says, hey, but you build a cold mill. You're building a cold mill now. You haven't even started up. And you're building a cold mill, and that's going to take all your hot band, and that's what I buy, hot band. And he says, that's not fair to me. Now, so we said, well, geez, well, then I guess we better double the hot side. So just as we were getting ready to st start up, we said, well, we got to go out. And so then we got someone else to give us some more money, and we got some more money, and we went out and borrowed, borrowed another hundred and some million. Again, so we doubled the size of our steel mill. So in very short order, we doubled the size of our of our projects, and we we're very the flexibility that you're asking about mm -hmm. was within our business plan, and yet we delivered every time we gave them a budget, gave anybody a budget, and this was all private money, because mm -hmm. we. Uh, but once we got started up, by the fourth month of our startup, we were profitable. By the we started up in January. By May, we were profitable. And by November, GE and Bain made we went public. We were listed in NASDAQ because they they this was an amazing story and they wanted us to go public so they could sell their shares. Mm -hmm. And these are shares that these guys on their twenty million dollar investment made $160 million after three years. So that's venture capital. <laughs> right. By that's, definition. That's, that's America. Yeah, yeah. Now they had to sell because those guys had to sell out anyway because of their those funds that they that they invested in us. They have a five year program that they can only be in anything for five years. So they saw this as it was such a good story that it was time to sell because the market could have turned or something else could have turned, and then they might not have seen as good of a timing. Mm -hmm. But then other other funds within either GE or Bain came back in and invested in us, and some of them are still in us today. Mm -hmm. 20 years later mm -hmm. because they see a value in our company. Mm -hmm. But those initial funds, which are the, the, the real risk funds, they're the ones who made us happen. They made, made us happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But great stories there. Right, absolutely. Now the flexibility then goes to the point of before we even had the, the coal mill completed, we'd already decided to build a structural mill. So I went about finding a place to build a structural mill and went out about finding the equipment and so forth. But in the pursuit of looking for equipment, going back to my story about Nucor and about how must get done, must get done fast, mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I know where a stru whole structural mill is that shut down, Bethlehem Steel. Used to be the icon of structural, okay? So I went to Bethlehem Steel and got, a, got an, an arrangement with a used equipment supplier to give me a tour of all, and, and Bethlehem had no more assets in the United States making structural, so they were willing to sell their whole facility down in, uh, down in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I got a tour of the place, looked at it all over, said, okay, gave him a call. I said, hey, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll buy the whole place, gave him a scope for X amount of dollars, so many millions of dollars. They laughed at me. They said, nah, that's way too low. I said, well, well that should be your choice. I said, uh, but that's my offer. I said, I'll give you 30 days and make a decision. <laughs> yeah, that's way too low. I said, okay. 30 days, call me in 30 days. I didn't hear from him. Mm -hmm. Oh, about 70 days later, including the, the, that, the 30 days, from the time I right. gave him the offer, uh -huh. about 70 days later, call me up. Say, hey, is that offer still on the table? Mm -hmm. No. Why not? Because I bought a brand new, road, brand new steel mill, you know? Rolling mill, that, that was the scope that I, I was offering on. Why would you do that? I said, well, because I, I needed a rolling mill. I, I made you an offer. 
because I was going to take theirs, and I, and I had all their drawings, mm -hmm. and I had an, two, two companies that were going to refurbish it and make it into like a, a new one. But because of the big housings and the castings and so forth, it could have saved me eight, nine months of time so that they didn't have to get those made in foreign, big foreign countries and big, big uh, shops, casting shops, and have machined and all that. I didn't want much of their stuff, but there were things I did want to save me time. And I said, man, you can get me into business that much quicker. And he said, you really went and bought a new, a new mill? I said, yes. You know, I said, you couldn't, you couldn't come to a conclusion, you couldn't come to a decision. No, nope, sorry. Yep, yep, sorry. So then, like two years later, I wanted to buy a, a big straightener, about a $10 million straightener, for uh, railroad, uh, for making railroad rail. Bethlehem has one. They have one down in Manesson, down here near Pittsburgh. So we go down there, take a look at it. I said, hey, I give you so many millions of dollars. And he said, oh, that's way too low. I said, okay, well, I'll give you 30 days. Think about it. You know, give me a call. So then, I don't know, 60 days later or so, they give a call and said, hey, that offer's still on the table? I said, no, went and bought a new one. He said, why would you do that? I said, because I gave you 30 days. I didn't hear from you in 30 days. I went and bought a new one. I said, you know what? I know why you guys went bankrupt. You couldn't make a decision. You have so many people. Your, your management structure is so big. There's so many layers. You can't come to a conclusion. That's why, I swear, that's why you went bankrupt. You know? That's the difference between a mini mill when there's, you only have a couple people. You can make decisions. Mm -hmm. Hey, you give me 30 days. I want to get back to you in five days. Because mm -hmm. time's money. Right. Uh, shockingly right. tragic. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so we built a structural mill. I mean, and doing great, and we make railroad rail now, and, and Bethlehem doesn't. They did, but don't, they don't. And they're not even in business anymore. You know, as, and neither are many of the other companies that uh, some I used to work for and others that were icons aren't, aren't around either anymore. Mm -hmm. So the landscape has changed amazingly. Right, right. Well, off camera, before we started, uh, we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the the fact that there were these large vertically integrated enterprises and that was the hallmark of American manufacturing mm -hmm. that faced a decline with whether it was the bureaucratic bureaucratic sclerosis or you know uh, the competition from from other countries um, and there was a door that was open for agile flexible companies small companies to to take over pieces of the market. And you talked about this retrenchment that they were forced to sort of cleave off little bits of their enterprise that, that these smaller companies could then snap up. Um, how does that story uh, continue as you start up with a, a small agile company? Steel Dynamics is now the fifth largest steel company in the United States. It, really? It's a... Uh, you know, it's it's still small compared to I think um, ArcelorMittal is the largest in the world, and mm -hmm. it's ten times the output of of Steel Dynamics. But that's still one tenth of ArcelorMittal is still a large company. Um, and you you said something off camera about how it's come full circle. Can you talk a little bit about um, organization and manufacturing and steel dynamics and, and where it is now and where you'd like to where like it to go in the future. Sure. Um, well, we've come uh, a long way from three people in 1993 to um, having built a flat rolled mill in Butler and then the structural mill in Columbia City. And then we uh, purchased a, a, basically a brand new mill that uh, wasn't operating well, uh, that ran out of gas and, and out of its receivership mm -hmm. in, in Pittsburgh, an SBQ mill, special bar quality. And uh, we've expanded it, and now it's up to over 900,000 tons. And, and the other mills, uh, Butler is over 3 million tons, the structural mill is over 2 million tons. And, uh, and then we bought uh, Roanoke Electric and uh, Steel Company, and that also had Steel of West Virginia, which in aggregate is, is probably uh, close to a million tons of steel capacity. And here in Pittsburgh, we bought three galvanizing lines, which they can coat together, all three of them, close to a million tons of capacity. Um, we um, grew from uh, Greenfield uh, a downstream fabricating facility called New Millennium Building Systems. And um, we had two facilities of our own. And then when we bought Roanoke Electric, uh, they had three facilities. And 
we expanded those. Uh, only one of those remains because the other two is the market uh, crashed in 2008, the economy mm -hmm. did, mm -hmm. and uh, there was overcapacity. We closed uh, two of them, but we also bought uh, a competitor who had about eight facilities, and we closed all but three, and now uh, we have presence in Juarez, Mexico, Fallon, Nevada, Hope, Arkansas, so now we're geographically spread across the whole United States because we're also in Florida, Indiana, uh, and Virginia, and so now we can carry national accounts and so forth, so that's downstream. Um, and we also uh, spent uh, about $1.6 billion on upstream um, scrap processing and uh, collection uh, services with the purchase of Omnisource. And I was trying to uh, relate this to the old days in integrated mills where they also owned coal mines and iron ore facilities and docks and, and shipping. Uh, they owned their own ship lines and they owned their, their own railroads, at least uh, local railroads or you know, short lines and so forth, and, and then downstream they'd have their own service centers and their own fabricators and their own bridge builders. I mean, you know, some of the names, uh, they built the skyscrapers of the Empire State Building and they built the Golden Gate Bridge and, uh, and uh, Washington uh, Bridge, uh, George Washington Bridge in New York and so forth. And, and so uh, as much as we as mini mills do things very efficiently with low manpower, it doesn't preclude us from from uh, replicating some of the good things that come about by having you know, uh, your own control of some of the things that are either upstream. Now, what we don't do is want to have 100% because the integrated mills, when they went out and bought coal mines or iron ore, they wanted to have 100% of their, of their needs covered. Well, then when they went into uh, a recession uh, or just a downturn, what do you do with those capacities? Then you lay people off, especially when they had, you know, uh, union contracts and so forth with defined benefit programs or pensions and the like, where we're much more flexible. Even though we spent $1.6 billion on a scrap company, you know, we still only get half of our scrap for our 11 million tons of scrap needs. Uh, we only get half of it from our own scrap company. And the other half we buy from our from their competitors, and then they also in their remote areas they sell to all our competitors. So there's a good balance in there, and so uh, good times and bad. Uh, there's that flexibility that you you know you uh, referenced before, and downstream in our in our fabricating uh, division, I I used to run that, and uh, and I always encouraged them to buy from other steel companies. So uh, because of logistical costs, because uh, we, we didn't build them in close proximity to the steel mills, it wasn't an outlet for us. Uh, they were built to make money in the right locations to serve markets. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's good to buy, and they are in the right locations to use our steel. But sometimes we make more money by selling to their competitors, and they make more money by buying from our competitors. Mm -hmm. So it's a very dynamic situation. Now, when uh, the market goes bad for everything, then we may appreciate them as a, a supply for, to us or from us, and they might appreciate us because then we can work on pricing. So there's that give and take sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the integrated world, when they had it, they were so the largeness and the inflexibility that existed, they found no way out except to either close it down or, or spin it off. And sometimes it was so large they spun it off and it was, a, again, a complete company, you know, uh, industry by itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, can I don't like the name names, but uh, some of the service centers were so big uh, in some cases that they, they actually went public and are traded on the you know, I, on, in the stock exchange, that they were so such a large entity, mm -hmm. and you'd say uh, that's just amazing that that was at one time a captive outlet for one of the steel companies. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, we do things in a much smaller, more flexible manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and you are also facing a, a global market. With, yep. With yeah, 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 we're we're constantly uh, you know watching that uh, you know as a. I'm currently the chair of the Steel Manufacturers Association, and and probably the biggest uh, threat today is uh, unfairly traded imports, mm -hmm. you know, of uh, different products. And uh, and again, uh, because the economy is poor just about everywhere, and in in most cases poorer everywhere, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, China is still an expanding uh, economy, but it's expanding at less of a uh, of an amount than it has been, right. and therefore, in in that context, and they being in many cases a a social machine mm -hmm. needing employment uh, as a tool for yeah. that social stability. Mm -hmm. They then look to the export markets uh, for a continuum of that stability, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, we uh, always have to be on guard for uh, unfairly traded products being brought to our shores. Mm -hmm. Again, you know our industry can compete with anybody uh, right. if it's done uh, fair and free. Mm -hmm. You know, but one without the other is not uh, is not acceptable. So there's steel dumping. Oh, all the time, every day, in all products. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lots. How do you know it's steel dumping? Because you know it's just below cost of production? Either below the cost of production or below the price that it's being sold for in their home country. Right. So uh, if they're bringing it here just because they can't uh, sell it in their home country, um, then it's dumping here also. Right, right. Um, and it's difficult to enforce for obvious reasons, uh, the same yeah. reasons they've had difficulty enforcing currency. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, in uh, budget constraints and so forth, when you have uh, so few inspectors. I mean, but there, there, there's so many examples of, you know, one country gets hit with, uh, you know, uh, like uh, duties and uh, on, on, let's say, the, the, the classic one is you know, steel uh, hangers, okay? And say, no more steel hangers from... I won't, I, won't, I won't even name the countries because I'm not here to bash them. Right. But, but no more steel hangers without paying this duty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then right away, steel hangers are coming from a, a third country. Mm -hmm. They don't even have any steel hanger manufacturers. Mm -hmm. and, but the same amount of hangers that used to come from this first country are now coming from this other country. Mm -hmm. And you say, wait a second. They're just transshipping them. And now they're all coming in from here. So they're, they're still being made. They're still being dumped. It's just they're just circumventing the duty, mm -hmm. and you say, "Wait a second! Now we got to go through the trade actions again <laughs> and file dumping duty, dumping cases again." You know, it, it's it's a game of cat and mouse. It's unbelievable. You can go on the internet and hire services for trans for transshipments of products just to avoid duties. They, they advertise mm -hmm. blatantly. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And it, it's so you you. T um, Achieve incredible uh, cost advantages by organizing your manufacturing in a flexible manner, in a way that's adaptable to change. But in a regulatory system, the regulatory system functions by almost by being slow. By you know, let's make sure we gather the evidence and let's hear both sides and so on. And all of that takes time, and people can take advantage of the difference between the the rapid change in the dynamic market and the slow sclerotic process of the legal system, whether it's a WTO or anything else. Very much so. And, and tragically, in, 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 our, in our system, we have to show injury. I mean, right now is a perfect case where I have employees, or I have three galvanizing lines that are not running full. We've had employees leave us because they weren't earning as much bonuses as they used to. Mm -hmm. So I could have more people working, but, I, but they've left us. Mm -hmm. But we're making money there because we're efficient. Mm -hmm. But I can't sell enough to bring back more employees. Mm -hmm. But I can't file cases against anyone because we're profitable. Right. But I should be able to, but there's so much cheap substitute steel here in this country mm -hmm. that I can't add employees to work here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we are cheaper than anybody else in this country. Mm -hmm. right. And cheaper with quality product, not cheap product, right. high quality product, day in and day out, mm -hmm. safely made. Mm -hmm. And I can't hire more employees because there's too much cheap imports. Right, right. But I can't prove injury. Right, right. And so this is a... a um, there's almost a parallel to the, the, the case of the rare earth minerals. So right now there's a real response to the industry because of export markets have restricted the supply of, of rare earth um, oxides. So mm -hmm. um, the response is to sort of develop you know, local capacity. Um, and it seems like there are similar, almost strategic 
dimensions to the steel industry. I mean, steel really becomes a massive industry in part because of its defense implications, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, do you ever think about that, or or at your level? I mean, you, you, a, a president of associations and so on. Is there ever talk about the strategic implications of American steel manufacturing capacity? Oh yeah, of course there is. Yeah, we we talk about it uh, on a regular basis. Um, you don't always get the hearing that you'd like when you talk about it, mm -hmm. but we just many of us make components and parts for Hummers or um, uh, missile components, um, and much of it is by American and so forth. And you'd like to say, well, you know, we have to make a full complement. We have to ha we have to make enough to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so you can't be selective. Mr. Government, <laughs> you, you you want it? You say you, you want to help us, and yet you don't, and yet you want you you tell us, well, we have to be there to to make these other things for you, mm -hmm. and you can step into our schedule at any time. They have the right to mm -hmm. break into our schedule and say, we don't care what you're doing, mm -hmm. make these for us, mm -hmm. and if they uh, if if we have the capability, they uh, we they own the roles. I mean, there are products that uh, I know that we were we were asked to quote on some Minuteman missile component pieces. And they, the rules were that you'll never own the rolls. They'll own them. And when they want them, they'll come in and tell you, make them now. Mm -hmm. You have so many hours in which to switch over. Mm -hmm. It was just a very rigid environment. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, wait a second. But when we ask you for help mm -hmm. on other things, where is that? Give and quid, take. quid pro quo, yeah. you know, yeah. help us out a little right. on some of this. Because what if we aren't here anymore? Right. We can do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, and I know government is just slow and cumbersome, and, mm -hmm. you know, we recognize that. And mm -hmm. it's not because they want to be. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I'd right. like to think not. Right. <laughs> I, I try to give them <laughs> some, some uh, right. benefit of the doubt. Exactly. Right, right. Um, well, I. I want to thank you for your time. It's getting late, um, and I, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk to uh, talk to me about this. And uh, I hope we can sit down another time at some point to talk about some of the other dimensions. But thank you so much for for uh, speaking with uh, us, and uh, uh, I enjoy the rest of the conference. Paul, my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>